Welcome to the local campaign and thank you for joining us for our debate in the riding of Ottawa Centre. We have seven candidates here for the debate and I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. But first, here's how the debate's going to work. First of all, we'll start with opening statements of one minute in length. Each of the candidates will have an opportunity to introduce themselves or reintroduce themselves to you, the voters. And the order for those opening statements was drawn at random just a few minutes ago. After that, we'll get into a series of debates about the important topics in Ottawa Centre, throughout the Ottawa area, and across the country in this federal election campaign. In each case, I'll start the discussion by asking a question of one of the candidates. That candidate will have 45 seconds to respond to the question, and then we'll open it up to all of the candidates for a free-flowing discussion on that topic. We'll move through a number of different topics that way, and then we'll move to closing statements and we'll do those in the reverse order of the opening statements, and each of those will be one minute in length as well. So let's meet the candidates who are here for our debate in Ottawa Centre. First of all, representing the Conservative Party of Canada, Carol Clemenhagen. From the New Democratic Party, Angela McEwen. The Liberal Party candidate is Yasser Nakvi. There is an independent candidate with us tonight, Richard Rich Joyal. From the Communist Party of Canada, Alex MacDonald. From the Green Party of Canada, Angela Keller Herzog. And finally, from the People's Party of Canada, Regina Watil. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for the debate. Let's start with the opening statements. And Carol Clemenhagen, you're first. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Voters were not dreaming of elections. Our priority, post-COVID, economic recovery. Working families, seniors, young people are stressed by increases to the cost of living, worried about health care, climate, housing. I want politics to be about collaboration and accountability. Our conservative plans for health and housing follow that path. I grew up on a farm near Buckingham, Quebec, went to university here in Ottawa. My career was in healthcare. Yasser Nakvi says he will leverage his provincial experience federally. Yikes. We're all still paying for the colossal electricity scandals from governments in which he served as minister. The conservative plan rebuilds our economy. Okay. On September 20th, That's I'm time. asking for your vote Thank to you. secure the future. All right, up next is Angela McEwen, the NDP candidate. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are here today on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Last week, our campaign held a fundraiser for Indigenous NDP candidates, and listening to their stories reminded me of how much a difference governments can make and just how much successive liberal and conservative governments have failed to live up to their promises of change. Like many people I've been speaking to every day on the doorsteps here in Ottawa Centre, I've grown even more concerned about the state of inequality in our country and our community throughout COVID-19 pandemic. The cost of housing is skyrocketing. Wages are flat. And public transit is expensive and inaccessible. And all of this is happening in a climate crisis. It doesn't have to be this way. As your member of parliament, I'm going to fight for our community and our most vulnerable, for our green spaces and trees, okay, that's and for our governments to Thank put you. people above profit. Thank you. Next up is Yasser Nakvi, the Liberal candidate. Go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Yasser Nakvi, and I'm the federal Liberal candidate here in Ottawa Centre. I also join, want to join my colleagues in acknowledging that we're meeting on the unceded and unsettled territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I'm proud to call Ottawa Centre my home. I bought my first house here and my, raising my two children who go to public school also in, in this community. I had the great honor of serving you for 11 years as your member of provincial parliament and together we worked on some really important issues, investing in our public transit, uh, investing in our schools and community centers. I want to leverage that experience. I want to ensure that I can use my credibility and experience for the benefit of our community and focus on meaningful reconciliation with the indigenous people to deal head on on the issues around climate change, ensure we're investing in building the new climate uh, technology uh, economy, and also something that's very personal to me is to fight racial injustice. 
on September 28th. I hope I can earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Rich Joyal, you're up next. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Rich. I'm originally from the north of Ontario, from Kirkland Lake, Ontario. I came to Ottawa when I was six years old. I was very fortunate to see both sides of both worlds, from poverty to being adopted into a very, very wonderful family. I've been walking the streets of Ottawa Centre for the last five years. I was also raised in Ottawa Vanny, but chose to run Ottawa Centre because I see the need for so much, uh, just so many needs for so many people. And this goes from the low income to the higher income. I see people as a community, and I see collaboration over uh, competition. So if you decide to vote for me, my platform will come out online and uh, we'll keep up to date consistently. You'll be able to reach me and myself and the different people that we're working with the campaign from all walks of life. And we'd be very grateful if you give us an opportunity. And I'm very grateful to be here with among all the other candidates. And I, I wish the very best to all of us that are here today and to all the people of Canada because this makes us very rich as a country. Thank you. Thank you. Alex McDonald, you're next. Go ahead. We are meeting on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. The Breton Flats is federal land slated for development. Subject to Algonquin approval, all housing on this land must be social housing. Furthermore, the rents should be capped at 20% of a tenant's income, and this cap on rents should apply to apartments across Canada. Switching to long-term care, long-term care needs to be put under Medicare. Furthermore, the pharmaceutical industry needs to be nationalized so that we can produce vaccines and personal protective equipment in Canada so that we're not caught waiting in line when the next pandemic hits us. Lastly, student debt needs to be cancelled and post-secondary education tuition needs to be free. If Cuba can provide this, Canada can as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Angela Keller Herzog representing the Green Party. Go ahead. Hi. We are here on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. An Algonquin elder recently said to me that we all know that the Earth's bounty is not infinite. And she's right. You will hear many promises tonight. So ask yourself this. How is it that after six years of liberal government, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions have gone up year over year, and we have the worst emission record of any G7 country. And ask yourself how they can say they're moving towards a green economy when in their very last budget they gave $5.9 billion to big oil in subsidies. It's the pipeline all over again. We have to do better. We need to do it with the knowledge that the planet is on fire. Justin Trudeau may have met with Greta Thunberg, but he certainly did not hear her when he said, the time is now. All right, thank you. Finally, Regina Watil from the People's Party of Canada. Go ahead. Lockdowns are ineffective, harmful, and they completely ignore the data. Hi, my name is Regina Watil. I'm with the People's Party of Canada, and I'd be honored to represent Ottawa Centre in the House of Commons. I have a strong background in the sciences, including a PhD in statistics and extensive experience in risk benefit analysis. Lockdowns closed schools, shuttered businesses, forced elderly to die alone. They've had a devastating effect on our economy, our mental and physical health, our rights and freedoms. Yet, they are still on the table. Why? Now people's jobs and inclusion in society are being threatened. Take the jab or else. Never mind that vaccine mandates are illegal and unconstitutional. That medical coercion is unethical. Vaccine passports are discriminatory and lack evidential support. The CDC has already admitted that vaccinated transmit the virus about as much as the unvaccinated. The People's Party of Canada is the only party willing to fight for the rights and freedoms of all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, candidates, for your opening statements. Let's move to our first debate topic, and I'll address a question to Carol Clemenhagen of the Conservative Party. At a time when affordability is a major issue for Canadian families, why are you opposed to the current plan to have $10 a day childcare? The Conservative uh, plan is to provide a 75% tax credit for families uh, purchasing childcare. This tax credit enables families to make the choices that work best for them. For example, families who work shifts, work nights, work weekends, 
it's often quite complicated to organize childcare. They have the opportunity with the 75% tax credit to choose the options that work best for them. Furthermore, the issue is childcare spaces. That is something within provincial jurisdiction. The conservative okay. plan is to work with the provinces to, to increase spaces. Now. I will, I will start, Mark, and, and thank you for asking this question because this is one of the issues that I'm hearing all the time. This pandemic had a disproportionate impact on women in particular. There's a reason this, this recession as a result of pandemic is called she-session because they're the one who lost most jobs. As we rebuild our economy, it has to be inclusive, which means that we need to ensure that women can get back into the workforce as quickly as possible. Having affordable, quality, not-for-profit childcare, such as $10 a day, is not only good social policy, but it is an imperative to have that as an economic policy. And that's why the, the Liberal Party is so committed to have a national childcare plan. We have already have signed agreement with eight provinces and territories. And if I'm elected as the MP for Ottawa Centre, I want to make sure that Ontario also signs on. This is our opportunity to finally have a national daycare plan to make sure that women and parents have ac access to quality, bilingual, not-for-profit childcare, such as $10 a day uh, childcare in our community. Uh, Mark, uh, I'd like to speak to that. Uh, I was speaking to a woman while door knocking, and she says that uh, childcare is $1,000 a month. Now, the Communist Party believes that uh, this is totally out of the range of many Canadians. We stand for quality, universal child care. That is, child care given by people who have been educated in this field, and it must be free child care. When single mothers need child care in order to work, and they cannot afford to pay $10 a day or $1,000 a month. Thank you. As a feminist economist, this is something that I've worked on um, for years. Uh, Justice Abella said that uh, childcare is the ramp uh, for women's equality in the labor force. We're still in a situation where there's a pay gap for women uh, because of time out of the labor force, because they um, sometimes uh, have to give up working. They end up getting penalized for that in terms of their wages, in terms of their pension. And the, tr the fact of the matter is, is that a tax credit simply doesn't create those spaces. Uh, we uh, had the Conservatives get rid of childcare once. We're not going to let that happen again. We are on the verge of a lifetime of work for many people, making sure that we have affordable, accessible, quality childcare spaces for people. I remember when I was a, a young girl, my mom was a nurse, and I was the oldest of four. And uh, since I was the best behaved, I would actually just go in with her to work <laughs> at the hospital. And uh, one set of grandparents would take two, and then the other set would take the baby. Um, and so I know what families go through juggling to make sure that their kids can be taken care of. And I know how expensive it can be. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, I'm really okay. glad that the Liberals have finally taken up the uh, 2015 NDP plan for universal child care. Okay. Hi. Okay, don't just jump in when there's an opening. Don't, I, don't wait I to be recognized. I feel that the best solution for child care is to put more, hand, more, more money into the hands of parents. Bureaucracy is expensive, it's inefficient, uh, there's a lot of waste, and it comes with conditions. So for Yasser, what will be the conditions of this $10 a day childcare? Will it depend on, do you have to go to a specific spot? Um, will it be conditions such as vaccine, the, the, the mm -hmm. COVID vaccine man, mandates? Um, what about when there's waiting lists and there's no spots available? What will happen to those parents, will they have to pay for another option and pay through their taxes? So I do worry about um, the, the, the $10 a day because of that. This, Unfortunately, this is, the Green Party would also support the provision of childcare spaces as a universal um, investment in the youth and the next generation. Um, we know how many returns and how rich an investment it is to invest in early childcare. And I think that Canada has the example of the province of Quebec that has demonstrated that there are economic returns to this as well. And that's a key point, the province. Child care is in provincial jurisdiction. The Liberals bring out a national child care idea. I think this is something like the ninth election where it's come out as the, the great 
liberal promise. Extravagant okay. so promises, so few results. So that's why that's why let's make sure that this is the last election where we actually get childcare done, and that is why it's really important okay. to re-elect a liberal government. Okay, to make I just it want to let Rich Joy I'll have okay. a, a moment so, here. Go so ahead. So I'd like to say few that, seconds left. I'd like to say that regarding childcare, it's basically going to be quality, like versus quantity. So it's all parents. It's all those that are taking care of the children. They are all the parents that raise the children. So we might we must make this accessible to everyone. Okay. I, I think we need right. to look. Actually, it's, oh, it's your turn it's now anyway turn. because I asked you the question, so you get the last 30 seconds. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I think we need to take a look at how the Liberals have dealt with the other uh, transfer program, and that's uh, health care. And it has lessons for all of us. It has lessons for all working mothers who need child care uh, support. Uh, Healthcare transfers were supposed to be 50-50. At the moment, the liberal provinces look like childcare spaces with the provinces, they're willing to go 50-50. Right now, healthcare okay. transfers are 20, at 22% of costs. So Thank that's you. what, that's time. That's what Thank you. we're gonna look forward Let's to. Let's move to the next question, which I'll direct to Angela McEwen, the NDP candidate. Uh, you spoke about indigenous people in your opening remarks. What specific steps does the next government have to take to achieve true reconciliation? Wow, so we're a long way from, from true reconciliation. I think true reconciliation means working with indigenous leaders, indigenous peoples um, to change how the Indian Act works because it's very patriarchal, it's very top-down, it doesn't allow actually democratic um, vibrance in, in indigenous communities. Um, people who live in indigenous communities can't take out a mortgage uh, to, to help uh, upgrade their house because of how the Indian Act works. On top of that, we have underfunded resources in uh, First Nations communities, whether that be Inuit or um, or, or First Nations communities in the South. Okay. And so it's we're not- It's open to everyone now. Okay. But you, you can keep talking, but it is open to everybody now. Go, go finish Okay, <laughs> yeah, so, so we're talking about in the mid-1990s, uh, Paul Martin and uh, Jean Chrétien capped uh, transfers to First Nations communities to 2%, whether it, um, inflation or population growth was higher than that. And so what that has done is created a huge shortfall in infrastructure for education, for health, for housing, for clean water. And we've seen uh, this liberal government be not meet its own uh, deadlines in terms of just providing safe water. Uh, we've seen the Truth and Reconciliation Commission come out and we're really slow acting on those calls to action. Only seven or eight of the calls, of the 90 some calls have been fulfilled. Um, okay. We need to work with communities to, to, to return land to indigenous uh, management and stewardship. Mark, this is... Uh Reconciliation with Indigenous people is a collective responsibility of every single Canadian. It's, it's a responsibility of us being a citizen. Last two and a half years, I was, uh, I was uh, leading a, a not-for-profit national foundation called the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. We worked with new Canadian citizens on talking about how they can engage in the process of reconciliation. And I often said, whether you came six years ago or six generations ago, it is upon us, it's our duty to know the truth, to know the colonial past, the racist policies that, that subjugated the indigenous people, and then engage in acts of reconciliation. We have to do that work at the national level, at provincial level, at municipal level, and at the community level. And this is something, as somebody who came to Canada 32 years ago, mm -hmm. I feel is so important that we have to do it. We're talking about multi-generational, so, so yes, we're talking about multi-generational trauma that will require hard work, persistent work, working with elders, working with communities, working with indigenous youth, and making change happen. And I am personally committed, so committed to doing this. Reconciliation this is, is about a reconciliation what is a be. is a forward looking process. It's not a it's not one point. It's a process walking together into a better future. One of the areas that indigenous peoples are interested and asking more of us as a country to be part of is the development of economic opportunities, including in the resource sector. Indigenous peoples often, by the Liberal government, have been somewhat discouraged from taking part ownership or participating fully economically. 
that's a demand from indigenous peoples that I think signals that forward-looking approach from the indigenous perspective and from the Canadian perspective. We need to move forward on reconciliation. It's a forward-looking process. I agree with Carol that we have to move forward from where we are now. And I think that the Green Party is very well placed to work on a nation-to-nation -nation basis because we share many of the values um, with indigenous um, leaders and elders, that being the interconnectedness and respect for the earth. I disagree with you, Yasser, putting it all on the people and everyone. I think this is a political challenge foremost. And, and I would say, alongside climate change, is the foremost challenge to our generation. Mm -hmm. um, because knowing there is a genocide which is continuing to unroll in this country um, is, should be shocking to all of us. And, and I've had communications internationally um, shocked and appalled at, the, disc, at the, the graves that are unmarked with that now number in, in the thousands. Okay. And I think there's so many um, recommendations that we have from the TRC, the Missing and Murdered Women and Girls Report, and not least from UNDRIP, that, okay. that remain I, I, would I just want to make sure there's time for others to yeah. get in. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, reconciliation starts with respect. And respect includes keeping your promises. So when you promise clean water, deliver. It also includes accountability. The residential school atrocities rest squarely on the government of Canada at the time, including that of Trudeau Sr. Only they had the power to take children from their homes. They had the duty to regulate these school, how these schools were run, and they had the duty to monitor the conditions. Has Trudeau apologized for his family's role in the residential schools, Yasser? Okay. Okay. I just yeah. want to give Mark. Alex McDonald a chance yeah. to speak. Uh, Go ahead. Alex. The, the question was, what, is the, what are the next steps to take once the next government is formed? We already know that. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with 94 recommendations. Only 10 have been implemented. They all should be implemented. Okay, Rich Royale, I'll give you a few seconds thank too, you, just because you didn't so thank get a you, chance. Mark. With all this being said, it's now enough that we have to move forward and take massive action. Everybody has the right to have homes that are beyond livable, drinkable water. So let's stop talking about it and let's just take action and do it together. Thank okay. you, Mark. Angela McEwen, you get the last 30 seconds on this. Thank you. I think in order to move forward, we need to be honest about our past. The federal government is continuing to hold files back from survivors about what happened to them. Even though there is a court order telling the, the government they have to release these files to survivors, they're going to court to prevent survivors knowing what atrocities were committed at the school. The federal government has done this. The provincial government also continues to take children into care, indigenous children at an alarming rate. There are also indigenous young men and women in our prison system at an alarming rate. And several have been okay. uh, in, that's time. Sorry, we, uh, there was a little error with the clock, but that is time. Thank you. Uh, let's move to our next question, which I'll direct to Yasser Nakvi, the Liberal candidate. Uh, Justin Trudeau, as recently as a few months ago, was opposed to mandatory vaccines, saying that they would be divisive for the community and the country. Isn't it a little bit unfair for him now to portray anyone who opposes mandatory vaccines as a threat to the safety of our children? Well, Mark, thank you very much for asking this very important uh, question. Our number one job of any government at any level is to put an end to the pandemic. This pandemic has gone too long, it's taken too many lives, and devastated too many families in, in our country. And the best tool and the strongest tool that we've got available is to put an end to this pandemic is through vaccination. We know that vaccines work. I'm a double vaccinated. I look forward to time that my young children could be vaccinated too when science allows it, because that is how we're going to ensure that we can put this pandemic behind and start focusing on inclusive rebuilding of our country. And I it's think it's really everyone. important that that message be delivered in uh, the tone of how that message is delivered mm -hmm. matters. Mm -hmm. The way the Liberals have been using the vaccine mandate as a wedge against conservative voters and rural voters that they think won't like them, uh, and using it to 
uh, really alienate that population that was hesitant to get vaccinated, often for very good reasons, rather than trying to remove those barriers, help people think about the reasons why they were hesitant, and, and approach them in a way that would help them get over that barrier without shaming them and alienating them further. It's, it's interesting that, yeah, that Yasser says that vaccinations are the most important thing. Clearly, obviously, that's the best way to protect ourselves, our loved ones, our community. Then why are we in the middle of a federal election in a pandemic while the Afghan uh, crisis unfolded before our very eyes and broke all of our hearts? This is the time where we should have been promoting vaccinations working with the provinces, again, federal-provincial collaboration, instead of the wedge tactics that the Liberals enjoy using with provinces and, unfortunately, sometimes between Canadians. Vaccinations are the most effective means of protecting our, our population. We should all be vaccinated. But the Liberals might have thought of that before calling an election during a pandemic. The CDC has come out and stated that vaccinated individuals transmit the virus, the Delta variant, about as much as the unvaccinated. I, I doubt that. I doubt, 74, I doubt the science 74% on that. 74% of cases. There is an outbreak in Massachusetts where 74% of the cases occurred in fully vaccinated individuals. They in Israel, have, they in have, Israel, they come in, in contact, Israel, okay. 60% of in those hospitalized with are fully unvaccinated vaccine. people. Sorry. The people who are unfortunately passing away now in hospitals. You are making that up based on The people on who nothing. are passing away are unvaccinated. That The statistics are there. The, the, yes, the clinical the results that are okay. there. That's not what they say. Where One at a time, please. I think think make, finish no. finish okay. your point, then we'll move on to some other people. The point people. is 60% of individual, individuals hospitalized with covid in Israel were fully vaccinated. The Health Canada website, I checked it out, did not state what you are claiming. That is a misrepresentation we, of we, the we facts. Can, we're, the okay. facts. This is a science-based, right, it has a few to be science-based. Yes, yeah. and I would like to see then, the science. We okay, have not been given the science. Let's move on to some other people. Science. I Go think ahead. that we can all agree that the more Canadians are vaxxed, the better we're off. I and do not we agree, we do not know that. public health environment. But I don't think that we can all agree that Justin Trudeau has brought this country together on this. And him introducing this as a wedge issue two days before the election, I don't think has served Canada well. Justin um, Trudeau. I don't think that we should divide okay. this country together on this. I think that we should work together with Canadians who are vaccine hesitant and try to assuage answer their questions, and assuage some of their fears. I, I the Communist agree. Party, yeah, really supports Alex yeah. McDonald. The Communist Go Party ahead. fully supports people getting vaccinated. However, let's remember that for those under 12, there is no vaccination. So what's going to happen with them? Well, they're going to be crowded into their classrooms. This is not right. There should be more funding put into schools so that we can improve the ventilation in those schools and decrease the amount of crowding in the classrooms. I would like okay. to clarify my position, all right? Vaccines can play a role if we did it in a strategic way. With vaccines, sure, everybody should have the right to choose. And it makes sense for some portions of the population to choose vaccination. Those who are at high risk of COVID, the elderly, those with comorbid conditions, and of course, anybody who wants the vaccine should be entitled to get it. But the science is not clear. We have not established the efficacy in a large group of, we have not established the efficacy in children and healthy young adults. We have shown there are very severe risks. Okay. And we have to look at the risk benefit ratio for the different groups based on their age okay. and based on, on uh, their, their gender I, I and have, based on their health condition. I have to say and, and, and make the point that vaccines are safe and okay. efficacious. The clinical trials have been well done. We I should not I, be promoting, we should not be promoting anti-science views. This is not cool. Did you read it is not the clinical cool. trials? It's did not, you read, it's, I did read the clinical trials. The well, clinical then, trials Then you did need to go back and read them again because you didn't yes, understand them. I did them. understand them. All right, that's the time. The clinical trials that's time. Thank did you. not establish Thank you. That's time. safety. Thank you, that's time. Thank you. 
All right, Yasser Nakvi, I asked you the question. You get the last 30 seconds. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Mark. As I said earlier, our number one job is to uh, put an end to this pandemic for the sake of our elders, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our businesses who have suffered as a result of this pandemic. And one of the strongest tools available to us to make that happen is to get vaccinated, to get those two shots. The Liberal government has procured enough vaccination for every single Canadian. I think most of us on this stage ask you, we urge you to please uh, talk to your health professional and find a way okay. to get yourself vaccinated as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the next question for uh, Rich Joyal, independent Sorry. candidate. Um, the pandemic, of course, revealed a crisis in our long-term care homes in Canada. What role can the federal government play in making sure that the people living in these homes are safe and secure? Well, Mark, just so you know, it happened to be that I was right at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. I ended up working at a retirement residence uh, behind the Montfort Hospital. And I saw different circumstances that took place. Um, you definitely have people of different ages that were affected in different ways. Uh, the people, for example, that were there, many people were restricted in their movements. I remember going one point uh, to a window and the window was open about, let's say, half an inch to an inch. Proper ventilation, proper food, uh, proper air that comes through the, uh, the air system, uh, ventilation. And also, uh, the workers were incredible. Uh, being in this uh, situation, but there's just so much more that has to be done because okay. the, it's open you. to everyone. Okay. You, can, you can carry on, but it's open to everyone um, now. Go ahead, please. Well, uh, the Communist Party believes that, uh, well, 80% of the deaths occurred in long-term care facilities. Compare that to what happened in hospitals, much, much less. So. Putting long-term care under Medicare will do much to address this issue. Problem, one of the problems with long-term care was that there were uh, multiple people in one room and it was difficult to isolate people who had COVID in some cases. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, people in the healthcare system were waiting for personal pro uh, protective equipment. We need to nationalize uh, the pharmaceutical industry in Canada and produce these personal protective equipment here, as well as vaccines. So we're not waiting in line next time. This what? is actually a crisis that was years in the making. When I talked about going to work with my mother as a nurse, she was a nurse who worked in long-term care. Successive liberal and conservative governments have underfunded health care. Stephen Harper cut transfers from 6% to 3% to the provinces. That's why we're only funding 22% of the overall health care budget right now. That, and that, Justin Trudeau That started under that the Liberals. Cut. That started with Jean Chrétien and Paul not. Martin. I spent my career <laughs> in health care. For about a decade, the Liberal government cut transfers to the provinces. Absolutely, the that's what I said. The Conservative Absolutely. government is going to increase the growth rate to 6% from the current 3% floor imposed by the Liberals. One of the things, one of the investments in terms of infrastructure that a conservative government will uh, do is infrastructure money for renovating long-term care facilities. The point was made by one of my colleagues here about the actual physical space of long-term care. Older buildings, the renovation aspect is a very important one. It's one that conservatives will invest Absolutely, in. but the biggest problem was that there was profit in long-term care. It was the for-profit homes that had the highest death rates and the worst outcomes. And that's partly because they shortchange workers. They use fewer workers, they underpay workers, and they rely on part-time staff that have to go between home to home. And that's why we had workers transmitting the virus between and that homes. Comes, and that comes back place. to the importance of the conservative approach, which is to increase the growth rate of that's unconditional... That's actually not going to fix it. That's not going to fix it. Health the only thing that will fix it. Okay. So I, I want to make sure we hear from some of the other candidates. I, I, think, I think there's, I think there's a, couple of, a couple of things that needs to be done. One, I think what we really need is a national standard of care when it comes to long-term care so that we can establish a floor. Provinces can go as high as they want to in terms of standard, care, standard of care, but as part of the condition of transfer payments uh, for long-term care, there needs to be a national standard of, of care 
where national there, standards there, already at least, existed. At least there's, that, there's parity. Number the, the two. The issue was funding. Okay. The issue was um, liberal time, governments let's, shortchanging let's the let's provinces let's on let's health transfers. Okay. Okay. Carol, I let you let's finish your point, so let me, if I may. The second thing we need to do is we need more qualified, well-trained staffs, like personal support workers who are there on the front lines working. And that's why one of the things we want to invest in is at least hire 50,000 more uh, personal support workers. And lastly, we need to give them good wages, at least minimum $25 an hour wages, uh, because so that there's pride uh, in the work they do. This is hard work that personal support workers do, and we need to ensure that they, they have a high guaranteed minimum income so they're looking after loved ones. Okay. So this uh, is one case where COVID has taught us some very important lessons. COVID unmasked how dire the situation yeah. is in long-term care, how little accountability there is, and it has run an experiment that would be very unethical to run, but we do have demonstrated results of how the nonprofit versus the for-profit long-term care um, Okay, I'd like, to, I'd like to say something here. The fact is, is that we're all talking about what should be done or what could have been done. When you walk the hallways of either a, resi a, res a residence of uh, elders that are, let's say, from low income, or do you go to a higher end, uh, for example, in different manners that exist, the quality of life from A to Z, how people live, it's very important that they live the life that is with purpose, they feel that there is something for them because there is. The same thing with their loved ones that they're able to visit, and the places should be made whole, pure, and not only that, truly, truly, truly be of quality because these people have come, they've either been parents, they've been grandparents, or maybe they didn't have children, but they gave to the community. Their whole point is, how do we exit and how do we take care of our families and these elders the proper way and the most okay. ethical way? Clearly, we need to future-proof right. the health system. That's time. Thank you. And as it happens, Rich Royale, you have the last 30 seconds on this because I directed the Thank question you, to you. Go ahead. This, this is something that's very deep for me because from the inception of being born, all life matters to the inception of when we leave this earth in a very ethical way. Um, you look at the indigenous people, you know, their history was that grandparents would take care of their children's children so they could learn how to, to, to have their children grow up properly and ethically. We're one family, and the fact is, is that when we walk down these streets and we meet each other, we're one family, and these elders that are in these retirement homes, they shouldn't be retirement homes, they should be homes that are blessed. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Let's move to the next question now, which I'll address to Alex McDonald from the Communist Party of Canada. You've touched on this already. Um, Canadians, and in particular, residents of Ottawa Centre, are concerned about the rising cost of housing and other essentials. What specifically should be done to make housing more affordable? Right, good question. Uh, currently, there's over 12,000 people on the waiting list in Ottawa for social housing. Mm -hmm. So... Um, a thousand here, two thousand there is not going to solve the problem. With Le Breton Flats due to development, we need to have all housing there social housing. Uh, I am a member of Acorn. We submitted our proposal to uh, our Acorn proposal to the NCC, and they didn't respond to us, even though we contacted them many times. So there has to be a change in the NCC board that makes it more amenable to having social housing built all housing on Le Breton Flats be social housing, and again, a 20% cap on rent, 20% income. Okay, it's open to everyone now on affordability. I think also speaking as an economist, it's very clear that part of the solution to the housing and affordability crisis in Ottawa has to come from the supply side. So the various deal sweeteners on, on how the next generation can lower the cost of their mortgage that is just going to shift the demand curve and make the crisis even worse. Ottawa should not look to travel in the footsteps of Toronto and Vancouver. And I think that we can also distinguish between affordability and deep affordability. I don't think we want to see the homelessness rates in Ottawa increase even further. Under the Liberal Watch, homelessness has increased 5%. And to solve this, we need dedicated investments using public land, and there is a lot of federal public land that could be used for this to provide for supportive and rental um, and public housing to start putting a crimp on that 13,000 um, individuals on the waiting list for deeply affordable housing. 
and the market will not provide that housing. That is clear. So this calls for concerted government action that we have seen a start on by the Liberal government, but obviously not nearly enough, because well, again, the numbers speak for themselves. Actually, okay. Angela, it's interesting you bring that up, because what the Liberals are building and calling affordable housing isn't anywhere close to what's affordable for most people. Uh, there was a housing project that was announced in Ottawa in February of 2020 that was deeply affordable. 21% of the average, um, sorry, the median household income in Ottawa, that's still $1,900 a month. Mm -hmm. No one uh, are working minimum wage or near minimum wage, no one on a pension can afford housing uh, that's $1,900 a month. That's what counts as deeply affordable for the Liberal government and their national housing strategy. That's why the NDP want to build in Ottawa over the next 10 years 20,000 units of non-market and co-op housing. And we want to build them in mixed uh, use mixed income scenarios. So not just, you know, putting everybody in social housing in, in one place in the Breton Flats and creating a ghetto. We want to create vibrant communities where people interact with their neighbors. And we can use federal lands to do that. We can demand, use community benefit agreements when we're developing federal lands like Le Breton Flats and Tunney's Pasture. And the city has also identified lots of areas where affordable yeah. development housings like this could be developed and make our cities more vibrant and more affordable for everyone. In I think we have to say that. In increasing supply is, is definitely critical. More available houses are more affordable. Uh, the Conservative plan is to build a million houses in three years and to incentivize building rental units. This is an approach that will augment supply, surge supply, and thereby create more availability and more affordability. The Parliamentary Budget Office released a report last month, just in August, identifying the fact that the Liberal housing strategy has actually been reducing housing supports, has not, in fact, moved the needle at all in terms of prevalence of housing need. So I think we need to really look at the data, look at the Parliamentary Budget Office reports, it's a reality check on oftentimes very extravagant uh, announcements or, okay. or claims okay. by the Liberals and very poor results. Okay, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like I, to add yes, sir, to that go ahead. Bit. Thank you, um, Mark. Um, as the Member of Parliament for Ottawa Centre, my first and foremost focus is going to deal with the issue of chronic homelessness in our community in Ottawa Centre. And I'm going to work very closely with our City Council champions like Councillor Catherine McKenney, who's done some incredible work on this, with our not-for-profit social housing providers like the Ottawa Community Housing, Cornerstone Housing for Women, CCOC, Salas, who does do an incredible job to ensure that we are building over the next four years at least 1,700 more uh, social housing in our community. Okay. And I agree, I agree with my both colleagues, Very Angela quickly. and Angela, that, that we need to leverage some of the federal lands to make, it, make that happen, Hello? and okay. I'm very much committed in doing that. Just the last 20 I seconds, wanna, go ahead. I just want to add that we should look at how decisions made throughout the pandemic had, has made the affordability crisis, uh, has compounded that issue. A couple things you should look at is the, uh, the effect of lockdowns, how it affected unemployment, job loss, how it disproportionately affected the poor, and lower class, and how it's pushed more homeless onto the streets. Okay. We have that's, to look at this so in the context time. of... Uh, that's the end of okay. our uh, Thank you. time for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex McDonald, I asked you the question, so you have the last 30 seconds. Go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, the Communist Party calls for a million new social housing units across Canada, and I disagree with the point that uh, creating uh, all social housing units in Le Breton Flats is going to create a ghetto. Uh, I said that the uh, rent should be capped at 20% of one's income, that does not preclude people who make $60,000, $70,000 a year from living in these social housing units. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we have time for one more question, but in this case, I'm going to ask a question, and each of you will answer it in turn. You'll each have one minute to answer the question. Um, so uh, recent events have shown uh, in Canada and in Ottawa Centre that Canada is not immune to racism. So what would you do to address racism in Canada and create a fairer and more equitable society. Carol Clemenhagen, you can go first. I think starting at the individual level, um, each of us as individuals need to speak up and stand together against 
hate-motivated incidents, actions, and certainly against uh, racism. There has been a rise in anti-Semitism, anti-Islamophobia, uh, anti-Asian, um, anti-black, anti-indigenous during the pandemic. This is a worrying situation. It's something that needs to be addressed in policy, in terms of protection for um, places of worship, for example. And the conservative recovery plan includes increasing infrastructure uh, for security at places of worship. I think fundamentally, Canada is a country that values profoundly okay. e equality. That's time, thank and you. And we should stand up. Angela McEwen, you're next. You have one minute, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, no one should be made to feel like they don't belong. And that's often what happens when there are from single comments to bigger acts of racism is people are made to feel like they don't belong. And Trudeau has said some nice words about diversity and inclusion, and they've talked about some top-down solutions like making sure people are appointed on boards. But the Prime Minister took a knee about racism and policing, but he's actually failed to do anything about it to stop systemic racism in the RCMP. He's also failed to take any action on sexism in the Canadian military, even though it's obvious there is a huge systemic issue there. I served as a naval officer in the Canadian Naval Reserves for 14 years, and I know firsthand what that feeling to be made that you don't belong, what that's like. Okay. And so we need to That's get time, unfortunately. Yasser Nakvi, you're next. You have one minute. Mark, thank you for asking this question. This uh, racial injustice is something that's very personal to me. Uh, I've spent a lot of my professional life working on this issue. When I was a, a, a professional cabinet minister, I banned the odious practice of carding in Ontario by policing, where people of color, black men primarily, were stopped and their personal information was collected just because their skin color or where they lived. These type of practices has no place in Canada, and I want to do that similar kind of work when it comes to federal law enforcement uh, as well. We, make sure, we need to make sure that when we speak of inclusion, that is no longer a choice. It's something that we do by default, where everybody feels that they belong. There's a lot of work needs to be, next needs to be done. I've spent a lot of work doing in this, um, and I look forward to undertaking that difficult work to make sure that we break down systemic barriers against uh, black, indigenous, and people of color. Thank you. Rich Joyal, you're next. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to be upfront with you. Um, I don't see color, and I, I, I see people. And when I walk down the street, I'm so fortunate and very blessed because I'm in the room next door, there's a young man, Zaire. Uh, that's what my friend Sir Pat, and he's from, he's Arabic, but to me, he's Canadian. Uh, I have friends from Gambia. I have friends that are from Nigeria. I have friends that are from Cuba, from, from Colombia. We're one family, so if we get to know each other, we're, we're all made from the same thing. We're all human beings. And it's, it's taking the time to really know ourselves. Like my mother would say, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. So let it begin with us. We're one. So when we walk down the streets, we greet each other with smiles, and we, we really take good care of each other to know who we are. Thank you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Alex McDonald. Yes. Uh Racism is a huge problem in Canada. Uh, we only have to think of the genocide of the indigenous people. And I agree with the answer. Um, the police treat uh, people of color differently. So we have to address that issue. And one way to begin to address it is to defund the police. Furthermore, um, the Canadian La Labour Congress and the Canadian uh, Peace Congress have stated that there are over 300 hate groups in Canada. Now, this is a huge source of racism. So the Communist Party says that hate groups should be prosecuted and outlawed. Um, racists get support from these groups. And once they see that these, these groups are prosecuted, they will feel that they don't have um, the right or the ability to go out and, and harass people like they do now. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Angela Keller Herzog, go ahead. Thank you. I think that systemic and structural inequalities um, reflected in racism are well and alive in all the institutions that we have in this country. It's very difficult for us to get away from our history. I think that we have to recognize our history as a colonial country and raise our awareness and start to address these inequalities. There are economic inequalities, there are social determinants of health that results in health inequalities, and COVID has taught us a lot about that. Did we not all notice how COVID seemed to have racially unequal impacts? That is just one of the lessons that we have to learn. So I think it has to do with understanding power, understanding oppression, and starting to unwind that, unwork that. Okay. And we have a lot of Thank work you. to do. That's time. Thank you. Regina Watil, go ahead. I think we should be against discrimination of any kind. Mm -hmm. For all groups, we should treat them with respect, whether it's based on race or anything else. When we look at the indigenous issues, it comes down to respect. When we look at our veterans, yes. it comes down to respect. When we look at all people, it comes down to respect. And I kind of wonder if we've learned anything from our history. Because when I look at, on the TV and I see Justin Trudeau spewing hate speech based on misinformation and dividing the country, trying to pit unvaccinated against vaccinated, I wonder, did we learn anything? We are in this together. We are not vaccinated against the unvaccinated. We are for choice. We are for the people. We all have, the vaccinated and unvaccinated are on the same team. All we have to do is respect each other. Thank you. All right, thank you. We are going to move right to the closing statements now. And once again, we'll do those in the reverse order of the opening statements, which means we're going right back to you, Regina Watil. Go ahead. Thank you very much. No vaccine mandates, no vaccine passports. If a passport can be required for this, it can re be required for any treatment, any condition, any reason. Canada is headed down a dark path and we need to course correct now while we still can. On the campaign trail, Trudeau claimed that the counter to tyranny is democracy, but that's not really the case. The counter to tyranny is freedom and central to freedom is freedom of speech. Democracy is important, but if you control the narrative and incite fear and hate, then it leads to mob rule. That is why we have laws and the Constitution. It balances democracy to ensure that minorities are not sacrificed by the wants of the majority. What kind of Canada do you want? Do you want a society where discrimination is the norm and the government micromanages every aspect of your life? Or do you want a free society founded on respect, fairness, and responsibility? Okay, Vote PPC. that's time. Thank you. Angela Keller Herzog, go ahead. Thank you, friends. We need to take the lessons from our indigenous leaders. We need to learn to live within the limits of the planet. We know that the climate change crisis, the fires and the floods, the extreme weather are here. The effects of these crises are always hitting the poor the hardest. And our children are suffering from eco-anxiety. We have heard lots of things tonight. Sadly, there was not a question on climate change. Sadly, we did not hear the Liberals or others commit to immediately stop the expansion of oil and gas extraction, let alone leaving fossil fuels in the ground. They are responsible for the year-over-year -year increases in greenhouse gas emissions since they came to power. Now is the time to address the climate crisis. Now is the time to make our voices heard. Now is the time to send a green voice to the House of Commons for Ottawa Centre. Thank you. Alex MacDonald, go ahead. The current approach to the climate crisis has failed. 2019, 44% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Ottawa came from the community transportation sector. Automobile industry has not stepped up to the plate. We must nationalize the Canadian operations of the Detroit Three, put them under democratic control, retool them, and produce zero emission cars and buses. Planes in the air are also another source of climate greenhouse gases that we have to address. We need to build a bullet train that travels from Ottawa to Toronto in under 60 minutes. 
This will be accomplished by nationalizing and retooled Bombardier and nationalizing CN Rail. See, the air industry will not like this and they'll try to put, thwart this effort, so we should nationalize Air Canada. There's no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you. Rich Joyal, you're next. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. So, in 60 seconds, it's kind of hard to cover all these incredible topics that are so important to us. Um, from all the people that are here, I know that we can work together, we can collaborate, and it's most important to do so. It's enough about words, it's time for action. Uh, you know, we have to take the steps, we have to sit down and talk, we have to have clear communication. When it comes to technologies, we can use it to be innovative. When it comes to being green, it's to make so sure that it is really green. At the same time, too, uh, we need to have incredibly great, clean drinking water. We need to make sure that the Indigenous people have homes to come to, that there are more than homes, that meaning that it's a true home to rest your head for their family and their children. The other thing, too, in housing, a lot of the buildings I walk through, a lot of people are saying that they need this and that. The idea is to sit down and listen. And also, I'm not about taxing the rich. I'm about basically finding other ways to bring the finances together to make it so at the same time to learn from each other to bring the people from lower in income and collaboration to the higher income okay. as one. That's Thank time. you. Thank you. Yasser Nakvi, go ahead. Thank you. My family and I came to Canada 32 years ago from Pakistan where my father spent nine months as a political prisoner. That is where my passion for public service comes. That is why I feel democracy is so important. I have the credibility and experience of delivering on behalf of our community. We deserve an MP who can hit the ground running and work on these very important issues and help build an inclusive society and economy after this pandemic is over. I will bring my progressive values and determination to serve our community. I make only one promise because the promise I know I can keep and that is I will work hard on your behalf. I will bring our communities together. I will make sure that we are finding solutions together. My name is Yasser Nakvi, and on September 20th, I hope I can earn your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Angela McEwen. Go ahead. Thank you. I want to ask you today, what kind of future do we want for our country? I want my daughter, Anna, to grow up in a country where every single person has a roof over their head, where workers are paid a living wage, and everyone has access to the health care and medication that they need. We've seen over the past six years that this Liberal government keeps promising to address the issues that you care about, but their actions show that they don't intend to follow through on their promises. Over this past year, the NDP have put forward proposals and solutions on getting profit out of long-term care, taxing the super wealthy, and building a brighter future for all of us. And the Liberals and Conservatives teamed up to vote those down. New Democrats are different. I'm not in the pockets of billionaires and developers. I'm an experienced economist with over 10 years of following okay. public policy. That's time. Thank you. Carol Clement Hagen, go ahead. We all want a return to prosperity and a safe, healthy future. Our recovery plans, fast track investments in infrastructure support local priorities. The Liberal government has damaged the public's trust in government ethics and accountability. When government sets targets, I want to trust that we are likely to meet them. The Liberals make extravagant claims and deliver few results. It is tough for entrepreneurs emerging from the pandemic. As Ottawa Centre's MP, I will seek on a regular basis, advice from our local business improvement areas. With the Conservative Recovery Plan, as your MP, I will get them the supports that are needed to help our local businesses thrive. I'm Carol Clemenhagen. On September 20th, I'm asking for your vote to secure the future. Okay. Thank you. Candidates, thank you for participating thank you, in Mark. the debate. Thank you. Good luck to you. And thank you for watching our debate in Ottawa Center. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.